So how are you guys doing? You know, each week you sound more like a bunch of New Yorkers, and I love that. Uh, Forget about it. Well, I want to welcome everyone out to Encounter tonight, Uh, whether you're here at the sanctuary, whether you're watching online around the country, either in Kentucky or Illinois or anywhere else around the country, we welcome you to Encounter. Probably some of you here for the first time. We want to welcome our first time guests to Encounter. Way to go. Uh, for coming, for checking out Encounter. Uh, you know, real, real quick, we usually say this at the end, but Encounter basically has four pillars. Encounter is built on these pillars of discipleship, recovery, evangelism, and community. And I don't know of a ministry that combines all four of those pillars together so that people can know who Jesus is and live the abundant life that he died for. And so that's what Encounter is about. It's for anyone and everyone who wants freedom. It's for anyone who who just needs to be set free. It's for anyone who really wants to discover the true living God and, and live the life that he so desperately wants for us. And so we're just grateful to have this ministry of Encounter. And one of the things that if you've been coming to Encounter for a long time is that uh, we, Encounter just doesn't meet on Friday night. We have midweeks Encounter studies that we're going to be launching soon. And we talked about how it's going to be a 12-week condensed, action-packed Encounter study. And with that, we've come up with the 12 anchors of hope. That Encounter is based on everything that we do from the entire year, what we do what we teach from this stage, what we teach in the Father's house or wherever God sends us, we're going to be teaching around these 12 anchors of hope. We know and we, we believe that this is God's roadmap for encounter and for everyone who wants to discover who he is and live the abundant life that Jesus Christ died for. So what I want to do with you tonight, and this is, this is going to be hard to do, but in, in the short time that I have, I want to teach you the 12 anchors of hope from Encounter. And each one of you should have a, a, a page that has them. You can follow along with me. And so I want to, I want to present to you tonight and give you the, uh, the company scriptures and talk to you a little bit about what each and every one of these anchors of hope is all about. Let's get to the first one. Anchor one, make the decision to get well. That's a big one. Make a decision to get well from my problems and brokenness because we're born into a broken world. We're all broken. And admit that I do a terrible job at playing God. All of us play God. All of us try and we try and do God's job. All of us wake up at some point in our lives and say, thanks, but no thanks, God. I got this one. You probably did that sometime around noon today. (laughs) Thanks, but no thanks. I got this one. You probably did that when you got on the five trying to get back into town today. Thanks, but no thanks, God. I got this one. As you were praising God with one hand, you were waving hello to the other drivers, weren't you? (laughs) We make the decision to get well. Why? What does that mean, make the decision to get well? Listen, not everybody wants to get well. There's a lot of people that say they want to get well. There's a lot of people that will show up here and say, oh, I want to get well, but you never see them again. You see, when you want to get well, you don't call the shots on how you want to get well. And this is a big deal. This is a huge deal. You see, and if you want to get well from your past hurts, if you want to get well from the things that plague you today, if you want to get, help, if you want to get well from the problems that you're being faced with each and every day, no matter what they are, You have to make the decision to get well, and when you want to get well, you don't call the shots on how you get well, because that's one of the ways that we play God. We say, I'm going to get well, but I'm going to decide which program I go to. I'm going to to get well, but I'm going to decide how I'm going to get well. You see, there's a great story, and if you look at the the accompanying scripture, it's it's found in John 5, and this is what we start the year off, and it says, a man was there who had been sick for 38 years. And Jesus saw him lying there, and he knew that the man had been sick for such a long time. And I love that. One, he knew him, and he knew of his condition. 
for 38 years. Here's a man who didn't want to get well, had no intention of getting well. And so we asked him, these are the words of Jesus. Do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? And just like many of us, the guy at the pool gave Jesus an excuse. Well, if I had a vehicle, well, I've had someone to pick me up. Well, if I had this, I had that. Well, if I didn't have this problem, I didn't have that. Well, Jesus didn't have any, he didn't, he didn't even respond to any of that nonsense. He just said, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And at once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and he walked. He didn't even want to get well. He, he was actually bitter that Jesus healed him because he, because he told on Jesus to the Pharisees when they asked him, who did this to you? Knowing that it would get him in trouble. And so the question that, he, that we all have to ask ourselves is, do we want to get well? And if we want to get well, we've got to ask the only person in the entire universe that can make us well to make us well. And his name is Jesus Christ. You see, getting back to this thing, if we want to get well, we've got to stop playing God. And here's the ways you, that you play God. You try and change your past. You try and control other people. You try and manage your own problems. You try and manage your own pain. But here's the biggest one. Are you ready? I, I just want to take you back to the basics. Can I take you back to the basics? There's, there's a great football coach in Vince Lombardi. Coach the Green Bay Packers. And after they left, there's a Packer fan. Sorry for you. Okay? <laughs> but after they lost... Uh, uh, a championship or just had a, had, a, had a dismal year, the next year, uh, in one of his most famous speeches, he started the year, the training camp, and he just brought a football to the entire football team, and he said, men, this is a football. And that's where he started. And he just started teaching the fundamentals. And you know, for us, we got to go back to the fundamentals. And I just want to tell you, friends, this, this is the Bible. And if we want to get well, we got to go back to the basics. And I just want to take you back to the first commandment. Oh, all the way back in the beginning of the Bible. Anyone know what the first commandment is? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. We shall have no other gods before him. You go back to the first commandment. We break that commandment every single day of our lives by playing God, and by doing so, we break the first commandment. When God says, you shall have no other gods before me, and you try and do his job by managing your life without his loving help and power, you're playing God, therefore, you're breaking the first commandment. And we got to get back to the basics. We've got to say, okay, God, you're God, and I'm not. And I want to get well. And I need you. To make me well. I need you to change my life. I need you to turn things around. Because I've done a terrible job at trying to do your job. And we've talked about this. A great prayer to pray when you're stressed out. And when you're in the middle of all this. You say. God you're God and I'm not. God you're God and I'm not. Don't just pray it. But really mean it. And that's the first. That's the first anchor of hope where you find hope by realizing you can't do this thing called life on your own. And you have to want to get well. And by doing so, you've got to realize you do a terrible job at playing God. Anchor number two. Believe that God's love and power can restore hope and healing. You see, you're not going to trust in a God that you don't think has his best interest for your life. And deep down, you're wondering two things. You're wondering, is there a God? And if there is, does he really love me? Because when I look at my life, I wonder where God is most of the time. And we all want to know, does he still love me? Does God truly love me? And does he always love me? 
no matter what I do, no matter what's been done to me. And so that's the first thing you have to reconcile. And you're always thinking it. One, does he love me? And two, does he have the power to fix my life? Does, in other words, does this stuff really work? Does this stuff called Christianity really, really work? And that's why anchor number two is believe that God's love and power can restore hope and healing. And what we're learning and what we know to be true is that God loves us despite us. And that God's love is not based on what you do. It's based on who he is and his character. And he made a plan thousands and thousands of years ago with you in mind personally to love you with an everlasting love. He forces himself to love you each and every day. I love what it says in Romans that God demonstrates his love for us in this way. He sent his one and only son to die for us. So the Bible says that when you ever wonder, if you ever should wonder that God loves you, if he loves you, all you have to do is look at the cross and he loves you this much. He's always loved you. He's never stopped loving you. And the best expression of his love was through Jesus Christ. If you look at the life of Jesus, you'll see how much he loves you. And that's why it's important to study the life of Jesus. And that's why it's important to acknowledge his love, to believe that he loves us. And that love produces an unbelievable, unstoppable power in our lives that nothing in all creation can stop because that's how powerful the love of God is. And that's why the scripture that we have associated with Anchor 2 is for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. That's a triple threat power surge that all of us need. And you're going to need that. And you need to know that. Because all of us become fearful at times. All of us get anxious. That's why God says over and over, hundreds of times, don't be afraid. Do not fear. And the reason why is because God didn't give you a spirit of fear. And one of the reasons why he says don't fear is because I got this one. I can handle this one. I'm a big boy. You can't, but I can. And when you're overwhelmed, you have to remind yourself, God didn't give me a spirit of fear. So when fear starts consuming your life, we're going to talk about this later on. And one of our other anchors, you've got to take that thought captive. You've got to realize fear doesn't, Obviously, this fear is not from you, God. It must be coming from somewhere else. But you've got to understand that God didn't give you a spirit of fear, but of power. And we're going to talk about that in a few moments. This is not just any power. This, is, this just isn't a little surge you get from a little caffeine from tea or one of these power drinks that you drink. This is, this is real power. This is miraculous power. This is resurrection power. You see... And when we apply anchor to this anchor of hope to our lives, we have to realize how powerless we are. Because it's when we're weak, we realize how strong God really is. And that's when his power has permission to come into our lives. Believe that God's love and power can restore hope and healing. Anchor number three. See, once you know that God loves you, once you know that he has your best interest in mind, You've already made the decision to get well. You already said, okay, God, I'm, uh, I'm not God. I'm going to let you lead my life, run my life. You have to make a, a conscious, intentional decision. Not so much to accept, because a lot of people say, well, I, I accepted Christ. It's like, I don't know about accepting Christ. I'd rather put the word respond to God's love by surrendering. My life. There's a difference between accepting and surrendering. There's a difference between accepting and submitting. There's a difference between accepting and saying, I'm all yours and I'll do whatever you want me to do. 
from this day moving forward. I was speaking to a guy that ran a program that I used to run for a long, long time uh, this past week. And, and he said, well, you know, surrender and obedience really does take a long time. Really? Why? <laughs> How long do you want to be miserable? How long do you want to play God? And people say, well, it's going to take me a long time to recover. Well, speak that over your life because you're saying, because I still got some playing God to do. Because I still want to live in this, this accepting world as opposed to the surrendering and submit world. It takes a lot of humility to say, God, I'm all yours. I'll do whatever you want me to do. And that's what Anchor 3 is all about here at Encounter. It's not just acknowledging Jesus. It's not just making him your homie. It's not just, you know, that's right, Myra. It's not just accepting that God's own son died on the cross for you. It's surrendering your entire life to Jesus Christ and will. Not just your life and your will. There's many people. There's a ton of people in churches today that are not saved because they've never turned over their life and will to the care of Jesus Christ. They've accepted Christ, but they've not turned from their sins. They've not turned from their life and turned to Jesus Christ. Believe Receive, repent, and trust in him and him alone for the forgiveness of your sins and the free gift of eternal life by giving him your entire life, not just your Monday through Friday life and keeping the weekends to yourself. That's not committing your life to Jesus Christ. If he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. And so God gave us everything that he had when he gave us his son. And all he wants is our love back and our devotion back. You know, one of the ways that you can know that you were created in the image of God is that you have the ability to choose. Every day you have the ability to choose because it's not real love without a choice. Otherwise, God would have a bunch of puppets around. And so you, we, we have this gift called free will. And it's up to you whether to submit, surrender, reject, or accept, whatever you want to do. God's not going to push himself on us. But I will tell you this, that when we do respond to the love of God by surrendering our lives and our will to Jesus Christ, he changes everything because there's a transaction that takes place. There's a real transaction that takes place at the cross. You know, one of the last things that Jesus didn't say on the cross is, hey, I'm still working on it. No, he said it's finished. He didn't go to the president of Russia and say, give me some more time. He said it's finished. It is finished. To tell us die. It is finished. And there's this thing that we teach around here at Encounter. By trusting in the finished work of Christ by accepting what he did on the cross so that we live a crucified life, dying to ourselves so he can be resurrected in and through us, and that's the life that God wants us to live. Okay? So it says in Galatians 2.20, my old self, there it is on your outline, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. But Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting. There it is, trusting. Not just accepting, trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You should read Galatians 2.20 every night and remind yourself, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. Because I have fully surrendered and submitted myself to the lordship of Jesus Christ. And that's what it means to become a follower of Christ. Not a fan of Christ. There are a lot of fans of Christ. 
but there are few followers. And I like telling people I'm a follower. You know why? Because if I really mean that, because Christianity, you tell someone you're a Christian, Christian can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. Tell someone you're a follower of Jesus. What, what I love about saying that is when I tell someone I'm a follower of Jesus, Holy Spirit will always tell me the areas of my life I'm not following Jesus in. And I need that accountability, and so do you. So once we've applied and start living out these, these first three anchors of hope, it's important, as I mentioned a, a few minutes ago, that a real transaction takes place. And that you become somebody new. The old is gone, and you got a new life. You get a new heart with new and right desires. You get the mind of Christ. You get the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. You're called somebody different than who you call yourself. You're accepted. You're secure. You're significant. You're a child of the king. You're an heir to the throne. You rule and reign with Christ. You sit at God's right hand alongside Jesus as part of your inheritance that's sealed with you in you through the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. You are sealed. You are marked once you become a follower of Jesus and a real transaction takes place. You are not the same anymore. You are not the same anymore. And this is important because if you don't know who you are, you won't know what your purpose is and you'll never know where you're headed. And most Christians, followers even of Jesus, will spend an entire lifetime trying to become somebody they already are. And you don't have to spend a lifetime trying to become somebody you already are. You can believe and receive today that you are a child of the one true king. You are, you are secure, you're accepted, you're significant in Christ. You are somebody in Christ. It doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, you are a child of the one true king. You're a king's kid, and your father is bunkers about you. That is who you are in Christ. You see, the world will want you to believe that you are your sins and that you are your defects because they don't have an answer for your problems. They will tell you that you have an incurable disease. And the first, and the first step of getting out of denial is to admit what you do. I'm an alcoholic. I'm a rageaholic. I'm a shopaholic. I'm lazy. I'm this. I'll always be like this. that's not who you are. It may be things that you've done, maybe things that you've struggled with, but it's not who you are. And that's why we talk a lot about identity. You got to know who you are. Because if you don't know who you are, you won't know what your purpose is, and you'll never know where you're headed. Jesus Christ was attacked in his identity the moment he started his ministry till his last dying breath on the cross. When he was full of the spirit and tempted into the desert for 40 days, the devil tempted him and prefaced each, each temptation with if you're the son of God, if you're the son of God, if you're the son of God, all the way to the cross, if you're the son of God, go save yourself. And if Jesus was tempted in his identity because the devil knew if he could get him to question who he is, he'll miss out on his purpose was, and that was to destroy him. And if, listen, and if Jesus is attacked in his identity, we're going to be attacked in our identity, and we just have to believe who we are in Christ. And there are, there are close to 100, maybe even more, in Christ scriptures in the New Testament that validate who you are in Christ. And it's important for you to study them. It's important for you to know them. Like no condemnation for those that are in Christ. Therefore now, there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ. You have to know who you are. And you're a saint. The Bible calls you a saint. You may not act like a saint. But that's who you are that's who you are. It's important to know your identity. So, we submit, realize who we are, and reject the lie that I am my character defects and my sins. That's the fourth anchor. 
2 Corinthians 5, 17, anyone who belongs to Christ is a new person. The past is forgotten and everything is new. How many people here are glad that God makes things new? He makes things new. You're made new the moment you trust in Jesus Christ. Anchor number five. Now, this is an important one. I get honest about my past so I can discover God's best version of me. Get honest about my past so I can discover God's best version of me. So here's the problem. It took you a long time to get as screwed up as you are today. It just didn't happen overnight. You didn't wake up and say, oops. <laughs> it took you a long time to start building a lot of your character defects, a lot of your bad coping mechanisms, a lot of your habits, a lot of your hang-ups, a lot of things like that. And, and then the other problem that we have is that even though, even though we know that when God forgave us, when we submitted, surrendered our lives to him, a lot of you still are overridden with this thing called guilt, shame, and regrets. And you don't know how to get rid of them. And you can hear from a guy like me or people of faith that will say, it's forgiven. But for many of us, you've got to go back and you've got to, you've got to, you've got to do an inventory of how you became the person you are today so that you can know how to become God's best version of you tomorrow. And it's important for you to acknowledge that so you can look at every event in your life, how you responded, how you coped, how it made you into the person you are today, and say, you know what? When I gave my life to you, Jesus, you forgave all of this. But I'm acknowledging it to you today, even though I know I've been forgiven. You see, other programs will have you do this to ask for forgiveness again. That's just dumb. You're already forgiven. You don't have to do something to be forgiven again. You just have to do it so that you can be free once and for all. You know, David, King David, when he went into his like midlife crisis with Bathsheba, and sort of lost it for a couple of years. Did his own sort of coming back to God inventory and sort of he wrote psalms and prayers to God. And Psalm 32 is his coming to his senses, you know, taking a look back on his life. And I love what the verse that we have here is Psalm 32 too. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt whose lives are lived in complete honesty. I love that. And I love what it says. I, just looking at the whole one in the, in the original New Living Translation, it says this, Oh, what joy for those whose rebellion is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of sin, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. When I refuse to confess my sin, I was weak and miserable, and I groaned all day long. Day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Any me too's on that? Amen. Finally, finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide them. I said to myself, I'll confess my rebellion to the Lord, and you forgave me, and I love this. All my guilt is gone. See you later. Adios. Good night. And I love this. Therefore, let all the godly confess their rebellion to you while there is time that they may not drown in the floodwaters of judgment. For you are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble. You surround me with songs of victory. You know what's interesting about this psalm is that D David's writing it, but God shows up in the middle of it. And God starts speaking. And verse 8 is actually God speaking to David and to all of us. And here's what he says. The Lord says... I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. Another translation says, I will counsel you. I will provide the best pathway and counsel you and watch over you. I love this in verse 9. It's one of my wife's favorite scriptures. 
Do not be like a senseless horse or mule that needs a bit and bridle to keep it under control. <laughs> Many sorrows come to the wicked, but unfailing love surrounds those who trust the Lord. So rejoice in the Lord and be glad, all you who obey him. Shout for joy, all you whose hearts are pure. Now let me just mention this one thing about doing, going back in your past and submitting, surrendering your life and to God and living a life of, of complete honesty. Obedience is a terrible word today. Nobody likes to hear it because nobody wants to be told what to do. Don't tell me what to do. You're judging me. That's like, you, you know, that's like a hot thing now. And so what you have now are a bunch of churches, all they, all they preach on is grace, grace, grace. And they leave truth to the side. And that's just a sentimental church. On the, on the flip side, if you got truth with no, with no grace, it could be legalistic. But you have grace and truth, because that's how Jesus came, that's how he did ministry, of the power of God that leads people to salvation. But let me say this, when you really have a true salvation experience, when you really know how much you've been forgiven, because the Bible says those who have been forgiven much, they love much. You don't have any capacity to love until you've been forgiven. And you can never be forgiven until you accept Jesus Christ. And there's something that should take place in your heart. And what, what should take place in your heart as evidence that you really had a salvation experience is gratitude for what he's done for you. Is, is overwhelming gratitude for his grace that you didn't deserve that washed away all your sins that you'll ever commit in this entire lifetime, give you an eternal home in heaven, deposit the Holy Spirit who lives inside of you to give you resurrection power. There should be a gratitude that overwhelms you to just obey God out of gratitude, not obligation. Because if you're obeying God out of obligation, you're living under the law. But if you're being led by the Spirit and under grace, that is the way Jesus wants us to follow him. And Jesus said, if you love me, you, you'll obey me. But we do it out of gratitude for what he's done for us as the motivation. And that's the reason why we get honest with God. That's the reason why we get honest with other people. That's the reason why we come to a ministry like Encounter. And then we have to allow God to start making those changes in our lives. You see, all that has to take place before he starts making these transformational changes. And let me give you anchor number six. Allow God to make the transformation changes he wants to make and stop trying to make them on my own. This is sort of a, an aha moment for everyone here. Are you ready? Stop trying to make changes on your own. You can't. You're not good at it. <laughs> I'm not good at it. There's this thing called God's sovereignty versus our responsibility. So if you're new to the Bible, if you're new to uh, some of these principles, these concepts of God, and what, what God's sovereignty me simply means, it simply means there are certain things that only God can do, that he will do, and that he does. But there are things that we have to do that only we can do, and God won't do them for us. God's not going to let his word dwell richly in us. We have to let his word. God's not going to forgive another person for us. We have to forgive other people. God's not going to make a decision to accept him, himself or our lives. We have to accept him. And the same goes true when we want to make godly changes and become disciples and followers growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. God says... I'll transform you, but your job is to renew your mind. Your job is to let my word dwell richly in you. Your job is to choose my truth over your circumstances. Your job is to be open to my Holy Spirit making God's word plain to you and getting in my word each and every day. And that's why it says in Romans 12, 1 and 2, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he will find accept acceptable. This truly, this is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior or customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. 
And then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So God says, you do a few things. Don't conform any. He says, offer your bodies a living sacrifice. This is how I want you to worship me. Don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Don't buy into what the world tells you. You need to be successful. He says, instead, be transformed. That's my job. By allowing me to change the way you think. You see, we start the opposite. We all start with our feelings. Feelings. (laughs) Feelings will destroy you. Imagine if God operated based just on his feelings. You see, God operates based on his character. God loves us because of his character for who he is. We start with, oh, this is how I feel. Oh, I don't feel like, I, 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 I just... I just don't feel like it. See, we start with our feelings and hope our feelings will translate into actions and eventually it reaches our heads. But God says, no, I'm going to start because the battlefield's always in the mind. God says, you allow me to change the way you think. You renew your mind to the truth of my word. Don't renew, just, and, and here's, let me just clarify that. You don't just renew your mind to the truth of God's word. We're going to talk about this in a second. You apply it to your life. You live it out. You choose God's word over yourself, your feelings, your circumstances, your life. And then God's job is to do the transforming. God's job will change you. If if you can allow God to... Listen, we all, all of us, no matter how long we've been walking with God, have a stinking way of thinking. God wants to change the way Bill Reese thinks two months from now because he's constantly changing me. He's constantly transforming me into the image of his son. That's what we want to do. We want to be more like Jesus. That's what discipleship is, to walk like Jesus, to do the things that he did. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. And so we have to allow God to make the transformation changes he wants to make and stop trying to make them on my own. Okay, that's only half of them. I got to run. I got to go through these quickly. Anchor number seven, close my accounts with other people by forgiving them and be willing to make amends by becoming a peacemaker. Close my accounts with other people by forgiving them and be willing to make amends by becoming a peacemaker. Listen, if you want to be bitter at other people, you'll never be better. You, as a matter of fact, you'll lock yourself out of everything that God wants to do in your life. I know of no other sin that locks you out of everything God wants to do in your life like unforgiveness and bitterness. And so we talk a lot about here about choosing the freedom of forgiveness and moving out of the bondage of bitterness. And Christ tells us, to pray for our, the people that have offended us, to pray for our offenders. Colossians 3 says this, make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony and let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. That's why we do forgiveness events around here. That's why this is a huge anchor of hope. Because if you've got bitterness in you, you've got unforgiveness in you, you're going to start operating in an area of woundedness and you're going to wreck other people. And we need to be a thankful, forgiving group of people. And there's one conversation that's never going to take place when I see God face to face, and that's, that's the conversation of why I didn't forgive others when he's forgiven me of so much. Because as Jesus was teaching the Lord's Prayer, he says, if you don't forgive men their sins against you, my Father in heaven won't forgive your sins too. Now, I'm not going to wait till heaven to find out what not having all my sins forgiven really means. So I'm going to release my offenders. 
and I'm going to choose the freedom or forgiveness. I'm going to move out of the bondage of bitterness. I'm going to let the Holy Spirit lock that door, and I'm never going to go back there again. I'm going to close those accounts with other people. Anchor number eight. Allow God's word to become the authority over my life. There's people that read God's word. There's people that apply God's word. But few people make God's word the authority over their lives. When I gave my life to Christ over 20 years ago, I made a decision that God's word was going to be the authority over my life. That everything I would read in this book would be the authority over my life. That I would submit to it. That I would obey it that I would live it out, no matter how hard it would be, that I would do it, no matter what my circumstances were. David wrote in Psalm 19:7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making the wise simple. He's saying a few things there. One, he's saying that God's word is perfect. God's word can transform us. And God's word can make even the most simple person full of wisdom sort of like a picture of a revolving door where people just let anything and anything out. And people do that with, with things that they believe, things that they hear, things that they see. You know, if, you, if you're, I hope you're not, but there's two words that are dominating the political world today. It's called fake news. That's all there is. It's fake news. Nothing is real. It's all fake. But you, know what's, but you know, fake news has been around for a long, long time. Because every day, every day, you're getting a warning saying that something is wrong. <laughs> and it's fake news. Every day you're hearing something that you believe and it's fake news. Every day you're hearing a thought about yourself and it's fake news. Every day you're hearing from someone else trying to give you advice and it's not from the word of God and it's fake news. Every day you're hearing something, you watch something and it's fake news. And if you expose yourself to it, it'll take root in your life. And you won't know which way is up and which way is down until you make the word of God the authority for your life. 2 Timothy 3 says, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to, to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. God's word is his love letter to us from Genesis to Revelation, revealing who God is and how we can live with him for him. And discover who he really is. It's our, it's, our guide, it's our guide. It's got everything that we need. It's got thousands of promises that are all yes and amen to those that are in Christ. God wants to speak to you. And one of the ways, the most prominent way that he speaks to us is through his word. And he can speak to us in any way that he wants. But he's written his word. It is inspired by the Holy Spirit. So when you hear, well, I don't know how credible that is. Fake news. I don't know how trustworthy it is. Fake news. You can trust this book. This book is inspired by God. This is God's love letter to you. And you have to make it the authority over your life. Not the, just the guide for your life. Don't just pick and choose it like you go to a buffet so I'll have the lo mein and the egg rolls, but I'll leave the rice. Okay, no, you don't pick and choose parts of it to adjust it to your life so that you could still live in the madness of self-justification. You submit to it, make it the authority over your life in every area of your life, and you'll be blessed. And you'll walk with power. And you'll live in freedom. It won't take you a long time to recover. You won't have to spend a lifetime in recovery. You could be set free today. Just by opening this book up, I agree. You're right. I'm not. I agree. I'll do it. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. It's as simple as that. It's not that hard. You eat the food, you lose the weight. I mean, it's just not that hard, okay? So there we go. Anchor number nine. That's a commercial. Fake news. Trust me. Anchor number nine. Commit to a daily prayer life to grow my relationship with the Father. 
commit to a daily prayer life to grow my relationship with the Father. There's a lot of, there's a lot of programs out there. None of them are teaching you how to pray. Praying the power of the Holy Spirit. Praying the Word of God. Praying to get in God's presence. Praying so that you can know the will of God. Praying over people. Praying in authority. Taking back ground that the enemy has stolen. Praying for wisdom. But most of all, just to have this wonderful, loving relationship with the God of the universe who created you. The most beautiful thing about prayer is the more you pray, the more you're in God's presence. And the more you're in God's presence, the more he changes you. And the more you realize how much he really loves you. There's nothing like being in the presence of God. And so we do a lot of prayer series around here. We're in the middle of a prayer series now. We're, we're, we're resuming it next Friday when we're back at the Father's house at the sanctuary next week. We're going to be talking about the power of prayer. What is prayer? How to pray? How can I, how can, how, how can I pray these prayers over my life? And so 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18 says, Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Listen, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but I do know this. Whenever you see a scripture that says this is the will of Christ Jesus for you, pretty good idea to do it. Okay. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. Who are you letting rob you of your joy? Joy is a choice. It's like when you go to a soda machine. Choose like Mountain Dew, yeah. Pepsi, Dasani water. It's Italian water. I like it. But you choose joy. Every day you got to wake up, you got to choose joy. You got to choose joy. Every day. Be joyful always. Joyful. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Pray without ceasing. Pray continually. And give thanks. Not that all situations you can be thankful for, but you can be, you can be thankful in them, and you can be thankful that God is bigger than them. You can be thankful that God's going to work everything out for the good, for good, for those who, are, who love him and are called according to his purpose. A lot of people say, oh, God's going to work it out for the good. Well, do you love him? And are you called according to his purpose? Are you living out his purposes in your life? Because if you're not, he's not going to work good out of disasters. You'll be in one disaster after another, after another, after another. And that'll be your identity. Who are you? I'm a disaster. <laughs> That's not your identity. Be joyful always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Anchor number 10. All right, here we go. This is big. Get dressed daily for battle by putting on God's armor and taking my thoughts captive. This is big. Listen, one of the most ugliest things in the world that, could ever, that you'll ever see in life is when you walk out of your house naked. It's just ugly. It's just ugly. You see, you have a choice every day. And God doesn't want you walking out of your house naked. Trust me. But when you don't put on God's armor, spiritually, you're walking out of your house naked. And you're open to the enemy's attacks. You're open to the enemy just wreaking havoc in your life. And you know, there are three mortal enemies that are always trying to take us out. One is the world and its value system. That's why the Bible, that's why we talked earlier about don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world. And then two, there's there's Satan and the devil. Listen, if you believe in a God who loves you, you better believe in a devil who hates you. If you believe you have an eternal home in heaven, you better believe that there's an eternal home in hell for those who reject Jesus Christ. And Satan is doing everything he can in his power, whether you're a follower or not, to wreak havoc in your life. And so we got to go back to the basics. We got to go back to the basics. Put on the full armor of God. And it says this in Ephesians. I'll get there. We're getting there. Hang with me. Hang with me. Finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, 
but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. Listen, do you ever think that you're always fighting against the wrong enemy? Do you ever think the enemy is not your spouse, not your boss? Not the EGR, extra grace required person that, that you've been assigned to for the last five years? Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, friends, you know when the day of evil comes? At any moment in your life. Because he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. The moment you walk out of there undressed, not in God's word, not prayed up, not submitted, you're an open target. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist the breastplate of righteousness in place in which your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace in addition to all this take up the shield of faith with which don't miss this you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. So here's what this means. Every day, there's arrows, there's pretensions that are setting itself up against the knowledge of God thrown at you every day. Fake news. (laughs) Thrown at you every day. Thrown at you every single day. And if you don't get trained up in God's word by making it the authority over your life, getting dressed for battle every day and learning the spiritual discipline of taking your thoughts captive. It doesn't matter how many steps you apply to your life. You're going to always, always live a defeated life until you learn how to take your thoughts captive and take all those flaming arrows, pretensions, everything that hell throws at you and you say, but God's word says this. I reject that in Jesus' name. That's why it says in 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5, the weapons that we fight with are not on Facebook. (laughs) The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. How are you going to take a thought and make it obedient to Christ without knowing God's word and making God's word the authority over your life? You got to know God's word. But you can still take a thought captive. If you've never studied God's word, maybe you're intimidated. Say, well, I don't know if I can, I don't have much time. I don't know if I can, listen. Taking your thought captive, maybe you you can't remember a scripture, but you can say, I know this isn't from you, God. And I take this thought captive in the name of Jesus. Get away from me in Jesus' name. It works. Because you have as much power in your prayers as any person walking on planet earth. There's more power in your prayers than the entire arsenal of nuclear weapons in Russia and North Korea. Just in your prayers. Because the weapons that you fight with are not the weapons of this world. There is nuclear power in your prayers. And you have to understand and believe not only who you are in Christ, but the authority that you have in Christ. And that's why it says in the book of Revelation, the accuser who accuses us before God day and night has been hurled down, but we have defeated him by three things, the blood of the lamb, the word of our testimony, and the fact that we lived our lives not unto the death. It's just a matter of taking thoughts captive. What comes out of your mouth is either going to take a thought captive or make you captive. 
So how long are you going to remain in captivity? It's a big question. And here's anchor number 11. I got to move. I can spend all, a lot of time on this stuff. Anchor number 11, trust in the power of the Holy Spirit to lead and guide me. This is huge. There are people who are embarrassed by the Holy Spirit. People won't talk about the Holy Spirit. You know, people who don't understand the Holy Spirit. You know, Holy Spirit just doesn't give you goosies, okay? Holy Spirit lives inside of you. He guides you into truth. He counsels you. He is God himself. He's the only agent of God we've got. Jesus is with the Father. The Father's with Jesus. We've got the Holy Spirit, and that's all we need. And if Jesus needed the Holy Spirit to accomplish what he did, how much more do we need the Holy Spirit? Jesus said, it's better for you that I go. Unless I go, he won't come. And when he comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will speak for me. Look what it says in John 14, 26. But the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. See, the Holy Spirit will never contradict two things, God's word or the teachings of Jesus. And he never says anything without the Father and Jesus. They're all one. They're separate, but one. And we need the Holy Spirit. We need him to guide us. We need to submit to him. Those that live by the Spirit are called sons of God. If we live guided by the Spirit, we're under the grace umbrella. And God's word, you'll never understand God's word until you fully submit to the lordship of Jesus Christ and allow his Holy Spirit to make God's word plain to you. You know what people say to me all the time? Oh, I don't understand it. You know why you don't understand it? Because you're not submitted to it. Because it's not the authority over your life and you're not letting the Holy Spirit make it plain to you. Oh, trust me, I'm not a smart guy. I mean, the, the, most, the hardest book I ever read was Green Eggs and Ham before the Bible. <laughs> but when I started reading God's word, and I submitted myself to the authority of it, it was an easier read than Dr. Seuss. Because it just came plain to me. Oh, that's what I'm supposed to do. Thank you. Could have had a V8. Okay? <laughs> just simple as that. It's not that hard. You eat the food, you lose the weight. Okay? It's not that hard, folks. Here's the last anchor. Here's the last anchor. We're out of time. Live out and share the hope that I now have. If you don't give away what you have, you'll lose it. If you don't give, a, give away what you have, you will lose it. Uh, it tells us, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you now have. And so I always tell people, don't be stingy with your money and don't be stingy with your healing because we're to give away everything that God gives us. I'm not, no, it's just, this isn't a, a financial principle. This isn't a, a money principle. This isn't, uh, this isn't just uh, a stewardship principle. I'm, I'm going to mess the camera up. My, I don't want to get too close. Uh, the Great Commission, the last big command that Jesus gave before he ascended into heaven, go out into all the world. And make disciples, teaching them to obey all my commands, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Notice that he said, don't just go make it. He said, he gave the definition of a disciple, teaching them to obey all my commands. Go baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he said that with a promise. He said, if you do that, I'll be with you to the end of age. And so the Great Commission was never a church initiative. When you become a follower, when you have an encounter with the King of Kings who forgives you, loves you, and changes your life, you're responsible to live out the Great Commission. You're responsible to go evangelize. You're responsible to go tell others about Christ. I love what St. Francis of Assisi once said, you should preach at all times, but sometimes use words. Because people are watching. They're watching every move that you make, especially unbelievers. You will never lock eyes with someone that Christ hasn't died for. 
And you have to remind yourself that the only difference between you and anyone else in this world is God's grace. And when you ask people to see people through his eyes and love them with his heart, all of a sudden, you see people differently. And you want to talk to them. And you want to share the hope that you now have. The Bible says always be prepared to give an account of the hope that you now live. If you don't, you will lose it and God will find someone else to do it. Don't lose what you have. There's a lot of people that think, oh, I've arrived. I'm just going to go live in my corner for the rest of my life. Me and my Jesus, homie. And they lose it. And you find out that the latter part of their lives, they're more miserable than they were in the beginning because they never gave away what they had. Don't be stingy with your money and don't be stingy with your knowledge and your healing and most of all, Jesus who lives inside of you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for these 12 anchors of hope. They're not just a formula. They're not steps. They're not anything but inspiration from you to give us the best pathway so we can live the abundant life that you died for. Help us not just to to know them, but help us to, to live them out by the power of your Holy Spirit each and every day so that we can know who you are, how much you truly love us, what our purpose is, what we're supposed to do each and every day and how we can be better prepared for eternity so that when we meet you face to face, you can say to us, well done, my good and faithful servants. Come on in. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Let's worship.